Good evening. The school board meeting of Tuesday, November 8, 1994 is now called to order. First item on the agenda is adjustments to agenda. Are there any adjustments? Okay. Next item is approval of October 11, 1994 school board minutes. Are there any corrections? Okay. And it's stand approved as read. The, uh, the next item is comments by high school representative. Good evening. Um, we're holding a, a school-wide contest to find a new mascot. Um, during the next few weeks, students will be able to vote on ideas for mascots that they've been submitting over the past couple of weeks. The speech team has its first meet on this Saturday, and the debate team's next meet is next Saturday. And then my partner as school board rep is back from Massachusetts and will be here for the rest of the year. And I'd like to introduce to you all Pat Cotter, who is a senior this year. Okay, once again, my name is Pat Cotter. Uh, we've been doing a lot of stuff in the SAC. Uh, one of the most noticeable things, if you come to uh, our cafeteria during our lunches or before or after school, you will notice that a jukebox will probably be playing. The SAC and Natural Helpers are splitting the, the profits of the jukebox 50-50. Um, in sports, uh, basically our seasons are over. This was one of the first years that we did not have a state champion in sports. Uh, the cross country team fared, um, did very well and they came in third in states. The girls came in fourth. Uh, they both won um, regionals, which was a very large surprise. They were both ranked um, second and third respectively. Uh, the girls uh, soccer team lost in the quarters. The boys lost to Portland in the regionals, and the field hockey lost in the quarters. Uh, the Needy Family Project is going on. Each class is sponsoring uh, one family. Uh, they each get a turkey and uh, non-perishable goods. Uh, it's supposed to be just for Thanksgiving, but usually we raise enough food to at least fill a car, and uh, the food usually probably could go for a couple weeks. Um, Juniors have started their term papers. That's a big event in Cape Elizabeth because no one really knows what they're doing for the first few weeks. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Big Buddies has started up with kindergarten and first grade. <laughs> Any questions or comments? No? Thank you very much. <laughs> Middle school representative? Hello, I'm Monica Michaels. On November 4th, we had a social for the fifth and sixth graders, but our profit was $230. For the eighth grade science, we are making solar powered cars. The Z's have donated $600, and in return, we offered to rake their yard. An environmental group has sent us some information on YES. This stands for Youth for Environmental Sanity. We haven't approved it, so it's still just an idea. This Monday, the seventh grade is going to the Boston Museum of Science. The sixth grade is getting their gift wrap paper on Friday. This is to raise money for Chewonkie. The seventh and eighth grade girls basketball has started their season. There are three teams, the seventh grade A team, the eighth grade A team, and the seventh and eighth grade combined B team. The sweatshirt drive has started, and so have the yearbook sales. These deadlines are on Thursday. Fifth grade representatives have been coming to the recent student council meetings and will decide the permanent reps in January. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Okay, moving on to communications. Do you have any thank communications? you, and thank you both students from middle school and high school. Um, good to see you. I included a couple, actually you have a number of pieces of information in your packet, but I'm going to concentrate on two right now. The first one is the summary sent to Rick DeFusco from the NESAC accreditation that uh, we visited last year. Um, you did in fact receive the full report in I think it was a September board packet, and this is a summary indicating a continuation of accreditation for the high school. Uh, however, you, you need to be aware, as this list I think makes fairly obvious, that um, part of that process is uh, a list of commendations as well as a list of issues for us to work on, and there is a requirement for a two-year progress report 
so it gives you a sense as you look at that list of recommendations. Some of them are issues certainly that we have talked about and are well identified. Others perhaps um, of less vital importance, but I think you need to um, think about those and any thoughts you may have or any personal observations, relay them to uh, myself or to Rick because they will be part of what the high school has to look at in the next two years. Comments or questions? Uh, the second piece of uh, letter that I included under communications is uh, a letter sent to me regarding an invitation to Kelly Hassan, uh, a first grade teacher at Pond Cove, and with also an invitation to another teacher yet to be determined uh, to participate as part of a panel of professionals discussing national literacy standards and assessment at the International Reading Association Convention in Anaheim, California to be held in May. Uh, we're really pleased with this because this is an offshoot of our attempt to understand better exactly what a reading program should be, could be. Um, we've had a number of discussions about that as well as a whole lot of work on the part of the teachers and various reports that have come to the board. Um, this comes really from the fact that, uh, I think it was about three years ago now, uh, when Beth Henderson was a principal, she invited Vicki Purcell Gates, who is the chair of Harvard's reading clinic, or reading department, really, um, Harvard Graduate School of Education. And she has been in touch uh, with us several times over the years, as well as coming back uh, the following year, discussing, uh, putting whole language in perspective, I guess, is the best way I would put it. So that some of our work has been with that kind of um, impetus, and she, it is she who is responsible for this invitation. She has found in her work, obviously, uh, contacted by schools, you know, across the country, that that issue of uh, the general move to holistic teaching methods, as well as the particular needs on phonics and various other structural issues of uh, beginning reading are not just issues in Cape Elizabeth, they are clearly national issues. And she is impressed with our efforts to understand and improve and uh, engage in dialogue and, and bring parents into the issue. So um, in essence, the invitation is there, but it's kind of one of those non-funded invitations and I'm bringing it to your attention because we do have some staff development funds and I would like to have your support for um, paying the transportation and uh, hotel costs for two of our people to go. Um, I think I said in my notes, you don't actually have to take a vote on this one. If you would simply indicate your support, I will go ahead and take care of the particulars. But I did want to share it with you because I thought it was it's always nice when our staff is um, invited to a national presentation. And I think we can plan prudently and manage to uh, send them. Any questions, comments? Would, uh, how long is this conference? Is it several days? It's, it's not clear oh, from. No, it's not. It's level. probably a couple of days. This, is, this, this type of thing, it tends to be a two day. It might, it might involve uh, getting there the night before. Obviously, when you're traveling from here to California, you're usually right. gonna, if you're gonna be clear headed the next morning, it's kind of nice to have a little chance to so we're probably talking at least a couple of nights. Would they be planning on attending some sessions themselves? That's oh, yes. What, that's what oh, I'm yes. wondering. I mean, yes. obviously, it's great for them to go present. It would also be great if they could come back with some oh, yes. information. That, that is their sessions. intent. Okay. Oh, yes, definitely. Okay. Oops, Connie, and I would just like to add, I'd love to see them share then what they have learned with all the Pond Cove teachers when they return. Well, my conversation with Kelly about this was very clear that she was looking forward to doing just that, and I'm, I'm sure the other teachers would. Um, will be interested to. Okay. Having seen this whole, whole language holistic approach and how it's evolved, I, th I think this is a compliment to the staff for having turned around essentially when Ann came on the board. Well, it's a, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a struggle that other staffs have been involved with other communities been involved with, and I agree. I think it is a compliment to the staff and to the board to, to hang in there and work it through. Well, we have the, the Language Arts Committee that met, and Beth Henderson deserves a lot of credit for that also. She really hung with mm -hmm. that, uh, with those meetings. There were some um, difficult meetings at the beginning as we tried to sort out what the issues were, and I think um, things really have improved um, in, in the reading program, and uh, so they, they deserve a lot of credit. Getting things on a positive footing. 
Am I hearing support for the trip? I would support it. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I think the teachers will be very pleased. And those are my communications. I just I have a personal communication, and that is to um, everybody who sent my family cards, food, flowers, um, just called on the phone um, at the recent death of my mother-in-law. It was really touching and um, meant a lot to my whole family, um, the great support we got from the community. So just wanted to say a public thank you for that. Does anybody else have any communications? Okay, uh, moving on to the superintendent's report. And these are um, issues with, the, I guess, the exception of E, that have to do with either curriculum issues or directly student-related issues. So um, it's always refreshing at this time of year, before we get into budget, to be able to make a few comments about what we're all most interested in, the curriculum and student issues. First one, technology committee update. We'll actually be having an interim report, we, we trust. <laughs> Those of us who go to the committee meetings, uh, we have said we will have that in December. I just wanted to comment um, the progress that this committee is making, I think, is really quite heartening. Uh, and at our last meeting, we were taking the mission statement, which you saw last month, as well as some work that committee members had done to list specifics that we need to put into some kind of coherent plan on the goals for the uh, technology for the entire system. And what was coming out very loud and clear was the central use of networking. That is, uh, much of what we talk about in, in curriculum and um, sort of school improvement in general has to do with making connections, teachers talking to each other. Um, across grade level as well as from grade to grade about what is actually going on so that the student programs are coherent and cohesive. Um, the more we talked about the power of pushing for a really good networking system and we thought about um, the ways in which that would connect teachers where it, there really often isn't time, it is a physical impossibility to be in a number of different rooms at one time. Yet there can be, I mean, something as simple as email, of course, can put people in touch on a daily basis or across time. So I think you will see in the report that comes in next month um, a pretty clear sense that that is what we're going to be recommending and pushing for. You might think about it from your own experience and add to it. Clearly, there are all kinds of other issues. We, we, we have discussed the ethics issue. I think it was mentioned last month, too. but. Um, I think we're going to see a clear vision evolving out of that. I don't know if, um, as a board member on the committee, if you had anything you wanted to add to that, or? I actually wasn't at the last meeting. Charlie was at the last oh, meeting, so right. he may you know, be able to. <laughs> and I joined it late, but I, I think it's, it's formulating a, a goal. And if you're going to look at a five-year plan, you've got to have something that, that you've got to center in on. And, and I think if you're looking at a, at a system-wide approach, networking is a way of, of bringing all those, all those elements together. Um, there's a subcommittee form to work on the draft document that's going to come before you. Okay. So I, think, I think what's been impressive to me is the, the two high school students that are on this committee. That They, they bring a, a really good understanding of the need and also understanding, but they're also understanding, you know, the, the, the teaching element, the, <clears throat> the community element. It's not just their own perspective. I agree. They have been really fun to talk to, and um, it is their world um, in a powerful way, and you can see that that's happening. <coughs> can, can I just ask, does the committee anticipate having some kind of um, preliminary budget figure? Is there going to be? Are they going to be looking for money this year specifically for this plan? <clears throat> there I, I, I understand it may be somewhat premature. I'm just wondering. It certainly is our intention to take um, certainly the first step. I mean, we we understand that the importance of having a five-year plan partly means what can we afford next year mm -hmm. and so forth because these priorities, as you set them, and then you look at the realities of what, what you've got, um, what happens, obviously, is that the things get pushed around. But we will give you something. Good. 
I would like to suggest that we move an item up in my report. Um, I see two of our representatives from the police department, the chief and uh, lieutenant. Um, and we've had some conversation that would be under D, coalition and community forum update. Uh, with your permission, I will take that item next. I so. Because I know that they may wish to join in the discussion. In my board notes, I made reference to the fact that we have a coalition meeting tomorrow. We have a week from tomorrow. We also have a community meeting that will include the police representatives in the police department as well as the school, the town council, um, and other community members um, in our continuing efforts to get a handle on what are our problems with our young people um, is, and what does that, what are the implications for um, parents as well as school people in dealing with that. Um, and I included in your packet reference to an incident that I found troubling and, and since I have talked with the police about it, we discussed and perhaps we could join in this discussion a little bit. I want to preface this comment by saying I'm not going to discuss names and I'm not going to discuss specifics because that's inappropriate. But we had an incident of uh, some vandalism at, a, um, at an administrator's house um, happens to live in the town. And I think it's caused a lot of us to think hard about what, in fact, may be going on with our young people. Uh, I don't know that that has any connection to the, uh, our discussions about drug and alcohol, but I do believe these kinds of in incidents are connected with the fact that when a community is concerned about discipline, about behavior in a lot of ways, and our school authorities or our police authorities or our teachers or parents, for that matter, decide to put their foot down and say, this is it. This is the rule, and we're going to stick to the rule. What is very predictable is that students will push back. We are having more incidents in our bathrooms at the high school of insistence on smoking, various kinds of vandalism in the sense of marks on the wall, uh, something's being written on the wall. Um, but the incident that had to do with the vandalism was a neighborhood incident, and it involved a sense of people, uh, we, should be, we should be a community where we can go home and feel that our homes are peaceful, that we do not have to worry about people throwing things at our houses, that if our family happens, members of our family happen to be outside walking around, that they aren't gonna have things thrown at them, that there is a right to, um, to just do your job, and sometimes we do have to mete out punishment or at least discipline consequences, whatever you want to say about it. I call it to the public's attention because I think that our kids are, for the most part, really good kids. We do not live in a community where we are worried about drive-by shootings or any of those awful things that we, we do read about. However, even good kids can get pulled in by groupthink. Oh, let's do this or let's do that. And the consequences can be really um, very painful for people who are involved. So I mention it because I think that I would hope that parents in our continuing effort to be open, and we've had some discussion about whether we should even discuss something like this, uh, because we can't discuss details and names, and I have no desire to do that anyway. But my sense is that this is a community that wants to know what's going on and would, will be cooperative and will try to sort it out and help us. So the conversation with your students uh, is important. I also included in your packet a memo from Nancy Hutton um, that has to do with our concern about how students are making use of their time between the end of school and middle school and the beginning of sports practices. You will see that there are some rules being laid out there where we're asking parents' cooperation to, uh, to uh, recognize that we feel that uh, given the information the kids themselves have told us, that we need to provide a safe environment. And that means monitoring. That means uh, we, we could use some help in doing that. And I know that Nancy has uh, reached out and asked for volunteers. Perhaps there's some good activities that might go on at that particular time. But frankly, I think it boils down to the fact that uh, kids are kids, and sometimes they make very poor choices about how they use their time. So these are the issues as I see them in, an, in a fairly nonspecific way. 
And I don't know if the, um, the police want to share any of their experiences or insights, but I think in our conversations back and forth, we're realizing that the more we put our foot down, the more we're likely to have instances of people sort of pushing back. And we're going to need your help in making sure that we can get through this time and continue to express our concerns, continue to lay out what we think are reasonable uh, rules of the road and conduct and um, support us in our effort to deal with it. I wonder if, if um, one of you would be willing to come up and just talk about the kind of behavior you're observing because unfortunately I think a lot of parents are under the, um, the illusion um, that these kids on Halloween night or any other night are just out there um, just engaged, always just in innocent fun that doesn't hurt people. And, um, I think maybe hearing just some examples of the kinds of things that you've seen, obviously with no names attached, might make people realize maybe they ought to keep a little better tabs on their kids that some of these things are rather hurtful to others. Certainly. Uh, my name is David Pickering. I'm the police chief. Uh, just to mirror what Connie said, we, we have become a little bit more, quite a bit more aggressive in terms of breaking up juvenile parties, uh, something that uh, was reported in the paper a month or so ago. And since that time, uh, we've broken up four, and predictably, we are seeing uh, more rebellious behavior as we uh, come into these particular parties and uh, begin to break them up. The first one was about two weeks ago Saturday. Uh, the response was, again, predictable. We are videotaping uh, all the parties that we break up now, so not sure what we're going to do with that tape. Um, uh, in some instances, we are making cases against the students for illegal possession of alcohol or drugs, and of course, in that case, uh, that tape would be privileged and would not be um, allowed to be seen by the public. But I would expect that in some instances, we may be able to successfully edit this tape so that people can be identified, and I hope at some point uh, to be able to make it available to appropriate officials so that they can see what we are dealing with um, in these types of situations. Uh, Halloween night was relatively quiet, except for the incident which um, the superintendent mentioned, which was a little bit unsettling to us. We had to have a uh, police cruiser parked in front of this administrator's home for about three hours to ensure that further damage was done to the property. So it is disheartening. It is unsettling. I guess I'm encouraged by the fact that many parents elected to uh, keep their children home or uh, prohibited them from going to one particular area of the community, which is uh, usually troublesome on Halloween night. So we are seeing some responses from some parents, uh, encourage others to uh, take the initiative to assist us in this endeavor. And again, I want to invite uh, anybody on the faculty to come out and ride with us uh, any night so that we can uh, at least share with you all and with the faculty uh, what we're up against and what we're dealing with, and perhaps collectively we can make a difference in this. Questions, how, how has parent support been? Are you getting rebuffing or are you actually? Uh, it's been mixed. The first party that we broke up, we caught, contacted perhaps a half a dozen parents, so students that we had identified. Uh, and I think we could usually anticipate what the response would be uh, from some of those, which, which is too bad. In other cases, uh, we expected that the parents would be supportive. Uh, they were. They come in. They've taken an interest. Uh, I have since had calls from two or three parents who have identified uh, problems with uh, their teenagers and, and asked us to, to, to intervene or at least speak with them. So um, I guess those that are on the fence are taking the initiative to come in and, and ask us for assistance. And we certainly encourage parents to do that as well. Uh, unfortunately, there are others which have elected not to. Uh, I think the, the results of that might be predictable as well. At these parties, I, I have two sons that are high school age, and they want to be with their friends. They want to gather and have a place to socialize. When, when you go to these parties, do you get a sense that everybody's involved in, in things that we would be ashamed of, or is it just a few? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, they want to just be together. Yeah. Well, I guess everything is, is relative. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I can remember when I came on the department in 1973, we had a, had a law called the Knowingly Present Law, which meant that anyone who was knowingly present where marijuana was kept were all guilty by association. 
So, and, and I guess at that time there was some benefit to having a law like that. It wasn't on the books very long, but uh, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, with 80% of the student population involved in athletics, uh, many of them have elected to uh, uh, participate in activity, which is certainly not healthy, certainly not good choices. Um, are there some students that, um, that just want to, you know, be with their friends? Sure, absolutely. But we're seeing uh, more and more that these students are beginning to uh, uh, react to peer pressure or what have you uh, and become involved in something that's illegal. And that's something that I think that we're missing in this community and many others is that we seem to lost, uh, have lost accountability, or the students have. They don't recognize that what they're doing is against the law. They don't recognize that we have a responsibility to enforce the law. And we certainly want to bring them back to that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a real, it's a reality. And it's something that can be uh, hurtful to, the, to their future. So um, we want them to know that uh, we are, are going to enforce the law. If they are in these situations, sometimes the temptation is too great. Any other questions, comments? All right. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I have one more question. OK. Do, do you feel there's a, a general attitude of disrespect towards you people and, and authority figures and that it, it that's one of the factors that everything is just at a slow boil and anything will make it disrupt? Well, I guess we've always wrestled with that issue. I think there's always an element of disrespect to authority and, and particularly when uh, young people get to the point where they're out on their own, they're getting their first license, uh, they are really given a lot of responsibility. You know, mm -hmm. from 14 to 15, 16 years old, you know, they basically can't go to the movies without their parents' permission, and then all, now all of a sudden they have an automobile mm -hmm. and they uh, uh, have a lot more latitude than they did prior to that. So uh, when that happens, I think um, an authority figure step in and tell them what the parameters are, what the limits are, we're going to get some resistance. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do think that. Um, I used to teach a class down at the high school, uh, one, one class session several years ago. And when we talked about alcohol and drug abuse, uh, no one would make eye contact with me because they didn't want me to know that they might be inclined to have a drink of beer or uh, use drugs. Now, what I'm hearing is, you know, if I have a six pack of beer in my trunk, you know, can the cops go in there without my permission? I mean, it's quite obvious that they are breaking the law. They know that. Uh, and they are more concerned with skirting the law than taking responsibility for their actions. So from that perspective, I'd say that, you know, there's a, a less of respect than there was a few years ago for authority. That's too bad. Yeah, certainly. I think we haven't served them very well as a community if young people feel that they're entitled to um, treat you people that way or, or to treat um, any authority figure that way. Absolutely. Um, and I have one other point to make. I, I worked at the shed at the um, soccer game, not the state game, but the one before that on a Wednesday afternoon, and was quite upset that when the national anthem was played, I had a number of young people come up to buy candy bars and thought, gee, we really haven't raised our children very well if they don't know to stop and turn and at least remove their hat and sure. pause in their activities for that. And somehow it, it seems to be one big picture of how we are serving our children. I think we have to look at ourselves as as much as look at what they might be doing. I think. And that's a good example of what uh, perhaps the school or public safety or other governmental en entities should not be responsible for. That's something that should start in the home. Uh, and when we have to take on those roles, it doesn't give us enough time to educate or to enforce uh, the more serious laws or whatever, however you want to call them. But uh, parents certainly have to take some responsibility in teaching their kids that uh, there are laws, they have to be obeyed, uh, and if they are not, then there are consequences. Okay. Thank you. Right ahead. Um, my name is Patrick Carter. I'm a senior. Um, one of my jobs is, as a school board rep is to help defend the students. Um, I like to make it clear, I think the police are doing a very good job <clears throat> in handling the situations. Um, they haven't come in and carted everyone off and thrown them in a paddy wagon somewhere and brought them down station. And, uh, I think they also realize that not everyone at the parties is drinking. I also like to make a statement that the SAC does not uh, condone uh, 
any of this activity. My personal belief in Cape Elizabeth, um, I've lived here since kindergarten. Uh, and I, like the Chief said, got my license, got some freedom. Um, one of the problems I found in Cape Elizabeth is there really isn't anything to do on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, or like this week, a Thursday night, because there's not, we don't have school Friday. Um, there's nowhere to go. There's no young adult center. <clears throat> now, if you want, if, I think solving some problems, I think maybe setting up a center like that, putting a, putting a TV in there, a pool table, um, something that the parents could staff. I think I would give some place where kids could go. There really isn't any place in Cape Elizabeth that kids, teenagers, can go. Um, so their, one of their options is go to a party and start drinking. And with that, you have the problems with the police. And uh, stuff can happen, drunk driving fatalities and such. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Do you truly get the sense that if there was some sort of center that people would really use it? I mean, you have people that do I, have their driver's I licenses. They can go to the mall on a Friday night. Would they really go to a teen center in Cape Elizabeth? Well, this might sound a little stupid, but mm -hmm. there are some, like going to the mall, there are some problems with that. Uh, I don't know how to put this. Um, South Portland is very much into the mall, and there's a lot of South Portland kids, and there has been problems with Cape Elizabeth students getting forced out of the mall, and such as that it just doesn't get publicized. Um, most Cape kids just know not to go there. It's, I mean, we can go there and shop, but it's just like hanging out at the mall, stuff like that. It's just not um, as easy a thing for them as it is for us as it is for them. It's not, it's not to say like we're in a, Big rivalry. We always get. We go to the mall. And we try to have a fight. It's uh, just that's their ground. They don't come into Cape. It's just one of those things. I don't know why it is. It's just been like that for years, and I don't personally see it changing. One of the things that we've been talking about, Pat, in um, curriculum is some possible ways of working with South Portland in Scarborough, um, and I know that we've had visits back and forth between some of those, uh, particularly Scarborough and, and Cape Elizabeth and student visits. Um, I do think that's an important issue to bring our students in contact with students from those other schools. I think there is a sense of sort of being special and, and uh, regarding ourselves as separate and so forth. So I would hope that over time it won't affect you as a senior. but. Um, I think that is important, and I, I appreciate your comment. I had not realized we were having a, a turf issue, but I can certainly appreciate that that might, in fact, be exactly what would happen. I know that there have been some discussions about the centers, possible center, and I know that one of the things that perhaps we'll be talking about on the 16th is just this kind of a comment. I don't know what the solutions are, and I realize that some of those questions will be raised. Would kids really use it? If so, how is it going to be monitored, et cetera? Um, and we will appreciate the reaching out and asking students like yourself for ideas. Okay. Uh, the SAC meeting is coming up pretty soon, and we can, um, I'll ask that very same question the next time. I'll have a list of things that might be able to help. I'm not, I, one thing I want to say is I guarantee you there'll still be parties, even if we do have the center. I don't think there'll be as many. I don't think there'll be as many kids. Um, I think at the parties there'll be the kids that go there and get drunk. Except for, what about the dances, when you have the dances and then they're empty so soon after they begin? Uh, one of our problems with that is our DJ. Uh, we have had <laughs> trouble, we've had trouble finding a good DJ. That's been one of our main problems with that. So maybe the um, student government can it. work on getting a better DJ We're and working on it. better dances. The only problem with the dances is you only have them once, once a month, if that. Well. Because each school, each class usually um, puts on one dance, and the seniors, some years, put on semi-formals towards uh, midterms. Well, it'd be interesting to hear what student government yeah. comes up with as ideas that might help the community. Okay, I'll bring back some ideas um, next time. Charlie, Mr. Kerr, I would have to agree with Gail. Have being a parent of teenagers in that age group. It's a very apprehensive time. And it's a very mobile population of students. 
whether they're going to a party or not, they're on the road constantly. And even as a parent setting curfew and having, having and requiring them to tell us exactly where they're going to be, they're in total conflict with what is going on out there with, with their peers. And, and, and to be a forceful parent and try to, to set certain guidelines, it's a constant battle. And it's a trust issue. I, it's the mobility. That's what bothers me. Yeah, I my, wouldn't want the Matt and Peter to be going to the mall every Friday night. Yeah. One, one of my, this is just a personal opinion, is uh, my parents are like Mr. Greer, where they want to know exactly where I am. And once in a blue moon, my father will actually call where I am and see if I'm there. Um, I don't think, I think that's the majority of Cape Elizabeth parents, but I don't, I think there's a strong minority that I'm going out and see you, be home at one or something like that. And they don't really know where their kids are or what they're doing. Because the mobility itself can get them into trouble. And we've experienced that. So just being on the road and not even under the influence or even going to a party. But you want it, 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 you know, when I've gone out to search <laughs> for an individual because he wasn't home at a certain time, the number of cars that you see out mm -hmm. just moving around the community. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, they don't even have to leave the area. And, and I think it's, it's because there really isn't a common place for them to gather, whether it's a community center or not. And the board a couple of years tried with the, with the police cooperation to, to set at least a, an a area where they could congregate. And there was a liability issue because it was mm. school property. I think we want to trust our young people. And, and I think it's hard to be a high school student right now, anywhere. I can, I can understand both from the parents and the school board point of view, but I also understand the kids are, um, they're bored. To come right down to it. I mean, okay. some Friday nights, personally, I'll go down to like Kettle Cove and I'll sit there and talk for three hours. There's really nothing to do in this town. And some nights I'll go into Portland and catch a movie or I'll go play pool or something like that. But that's just me. Some kids don't do that. Um, it's hard to find something that keeps you occupied. It really is. I think this is really a multifaceted problem. There's no one group here who can solve it. Mm -mm. Um, kids can't blame parents because there aren't things to do. Parents can't blame kids because they're, you know, they're just being kids. Um, this is really, you know, I, I hope this, uh, the coalition and this community forum can really, you know, bring everybody together so we realize nobody is going to solve this problem on their own. Having a teen center won't solve it. No one, no one group is going to be able to solve this. The point is, I think, that we've got to get every group to take responsibility for what they can do. And I, I still firmly believe that the, the highest responsibility goes to the individual family. Um, to communicate with their kids, to know where their kids are, to do what your parents do, and that is, you know, not every time, but once in a while call, just as, you know, to keep you a little bit on your toes. Um, but, you know, what, what bothers me about the situation that, you know, brought, brought this discussion up tonight is that um, we, we've had an administrator who's simply doing his job and maybe has the misfortune to live in the town where he has to do sometimes an unpopular job. To be, to feel like a prisoner um, in your own house is a feeling I don't think anybody really wants to experience. And I think that's the level people have to think about what's going on here. If that's how people are being made to feel for enforcing rules that everyone says we need that are there to protect the kids and to, to have a sane um, community, um, then we've got a real problem. And I think that's you know, the issue people have to start to, to think about. Think about it on that personal level. And I don't think that's something, you know, people think, well, you know, kids will be kids. But I think you have to think about how you would feel in, in that kind of situation. Then we can work on all those other issues. But we're getting down to a fundamental issue of um, respect for other human beings here. And um, I, don't think, I don't think we want to be a community. Um, where authority figures or anybody has to feel unsafe in their, in their own home. 
for simply for doing their job. I think uh, I 100 percent agree with you, and I think you'll find uh, the vast majority of the student body in Cape Elizabeth is always a few rotten apples in every yeah. bunch, and um, you know they're they're the ones that are going to get the publicity. Um, it's just one of the problems having a school. You know, you're going to have those few people that are going to go out and do and have vandalism, um, but the vast majority of the students. I mean. As far as from what I've seen, and I have friends in other schools, um, Cape Elizabeth is a lot better than a lot of, a lot of schools. I, I agree with you, but we run the risk of thinking that we're better and not recognizing danger signs like that. Um, you know, somebody being harassed like that. Um, you know, if it happens once, it's easier to have it happen again. People get away with it. It's easier to have it happen. I totally agree with you. The vast majority of people in this town are good, decent people who would not, you know, condone um, or engage in, in that kind of activity. The problem is, is that if the rest of us kind of accept that activity as just kids being kids or whatever, we run the risk of it becoming in some way tacitly acceptable. And um, we could be in big <clears throat> trouble um, before, we, <laughs> before we really know it. And then we'll wonder how we got how we got in a bad place. Probably a lot of places that are in bad shape now just didn't see the warning signs and, and come to grips with it. And that's why I think it's just important that we discuss it um, you know, tonight and at these other meetings and take some tangible positive steps to deal with it. But I think, first of all, people have to realize that there, there is a problem. So, and you're right, most of the kids are great kids. Most of the parents are great kids. I'm concerned about the parents who, um, rather than accept that their kid may have done something, immediately calls their lawyer. I mean, to me, that's just, it's an unbelievable response. Um, it makes it difficult for us to work through it. Well, we appreciate your input, Pat, and, that, uh, and I also appreciate um, the police chief speaking about this, and we will be talking about this in our upcoming meeting. I just, you were talking about the underlying issue, and the, I think the underlying issue is the drug and alcohol abuse. And in some of the incidences that have come to light lately, like the vandalism at the high school, were all a result of, of children, and they are children, under the influence of something and not being responsible for their actions. So it's a double-edged sword that we're dealing with. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, you got to kind of bear the brunt of it because you were here, but we appreciate <laughs> your comments. You did a good really job. Really do. Really do. It is. It's a... Uh, I think what we're trying to do this year is to be more open about the issues. Uh, it, is, it is troubling. It's troubling to me as superintendent to sound like I am talking about the whole student body when I know I'm only talking about a very small number. And I certainly don't want to leave the impression that I am talking about more than a few isolated examples. But I agree that if we don't talk about it and deal with it as a community, we don't know where it will end and other people will get hurt. We had, we've had other instances. We had students being harassed last year by other students because they had tried to, to work to resolve some issues uh, at the school. All of those things are just unacceptable. And I do, uh, I really appreciate that the majority of kids, uh, it's like take smoking in the bathroom. It's only a few people who insist on doing that. And they really are holding the rest of you hostage. I don't know. <laughs> what we can do, you know, we, we get pretty frustrated as authority people. What do we do about that? Um, so we will continue the dialogue. We'll look forward to input from students as well as parents. And I really appreciate everybody speaking up on it. Okay. Now, the next items, going back to the others, um, we have two items on the school quality review and the MSMA conference. Uh, in the interest of sort of moving along, I'll kind of say my, I have my thing to say on those things really quickly. And then I know we had what we had, uh, let's see, Carla and Keith and Gail and Charlie and myself were at the MSMA conference. So I imagine that board members will have something to say in there too. Uh, in your packet, I included uh, you already received material on the school quality review and two of the board members attended a meeting we had last Thursday with some uh, teachers administrators and some parents. Uh, some of us uh, spent yesterday, as a matter of fact, over at, uh, at the USM Forum campus 
uh, looking at more details of that. And I think that the, um, essentially, we could go into more detail. I'm not sure that that's important at this point, just for the, if anybody hasn't heard about that before. The school quality review is a proposed way of helping schools, including elementary schools, take a good look at themselves. What are we doing and what aren't we doing? What would we like to be doing better than we are? In a sense, similar to the, we talked earlier tonight about the high school accreditation. However, the method and the intent behind the school quality review um, is frankly a more um, it's, it's more focused on actual teaching and learning is going on inside the classrooms, far more so than the normal accreditation visit. Uh, so that, I think, is something we, we are asking uh, our staff uh, as well as the board to consider as we move through the process. There's no decision to be made at this point, just a familiarity. Uh, I also included in your packet, uh, and I feel I really need to call your attention to it, even though I don't have a whole lot of information, uh, in uh, the Portland paper last week, there was a small article, it's kind of buried in that page somewhere, change in scoring of the MEA to show levels of knowledge. This is a pretty fundamental change. And the way this is going to be reported out, um, you know, you're used to seeing the MEA test scores for the 4th, 8th, and 11th grade. And I realize that an awful lot of people look at those, <laughs> including myself, uh, <laughs> when they're published in the paper. And uh, people tend to be either reassured if they see their particular school district uh, getting numbers high up in the uh, close to 400 or 400. Uh, this is really going to be quite different. And uh, for the State Department to kind of bury it in the back paper is a little puzzling because we don't know exactly what this is going to look like. Now, the eighth graders have already taken the test. And if you've read this, you see that they're going to be reported out in four levels of competency. But they're going to look like they were 25th percentile, 50th percentile, 75th percentile, and 100th percentile. And the best information I have on this says that from the 50th percentile up in the way this is going to be reported, that is, the, the, um, they're talking about uh, distinguished as the highest rating and novice as, as the lowest. Actually, the distinguished would be about the top 5%. And the, what's the next one down below? Distinguished, I've lost my place. Advanced. Advanced, thank you. That's probably 10%. And the shock that people are going to have looking at 15% as opposed to what they think of 50% uh, it beats me exactly how the state's going to report this out. Uh, we've talked about it from an administrative point of view, and um, we have various speculations on this, but what I think the board needs to be aware of, and ultimately we certainly need to try to communicate to our parent group as well as our student group, that it is possible to uh, have a situation in some area where we've been scoring, let's say, about 340 to 350, where we all of a sudden have most of our kids uh, in the uh, second or possibly a few in the beginning part of the third group. Um, and how are people going to you know, put those into some kind of perspective? The purpose behind this is to up the standards, because what we're seeing in some standardized testing, especially in international comparisons. Uh, and some of us at that quality review meeting, um, I remember, I don't have the statistics in front of me. We were simply listening. Um, but that in our, um, even in our, some of our best suburban communities, only 50% of our students are actually meeting uh, the standards of the NTCM, for instance, the National Standards Teaching of Math. And in some inner city school districts, it's more like 3%. But if 50% are meeting them, but what about the other 50% that aren't? It's another way of getting our attention focused on how well are we assessing how well our students are actually doing. Questions that this board as well as this community have often asked. How do we compare with other communities or perhaps other countries? How do we know? So there's a lot of stuff out there on the national level about changing the way we assess students. We've had a little bit of discussion with boards over the past two years about authentic assessment, about performances, about various ways in which students can show what they know in ways other than standardized testing. Uh, the MEAs have been partially 
first they were totally standardized, and over the years they have moved away from total standardized format to more open-ended questions, and now this year they went to total open-ended questioning. So I put this in here just as one more piece of data to show you that things are changing, and they are changing rather rapidly for schools anyway, and um, we're going to have to come to grips with that. So. I don't, can't tell you any more than what I have, but I just want to alert you to the fact we'll be talking more about that as these scores come out. They may, not, they may look terrible on first blush. What do they mean? They may look good if you know what you're looking at. So we will have a uh, conversation once we know more about it, but that is part of the change that's all around. The other thing I put in the packet were some, uh, the state, um, Learning Results Task Force connected to the state grant for Goals 2000. And it was a fairly weighty document. If you waited your way through it, um, I'm not sure that today's a, or tonight's a proper time to be discussing it. But once again, last year, people who were in last year's board, Jane Emerald came to talk to us as a representative of the state board uh, or a member of the state education committee about this legislation that is going to produce statements about what students should know. What can they, how do they demonstrate competency uh, in ways other than just standardized testing? And the Goals 2000 is going to bring money into the state to reinforce that legislation. We will be asked to take part in that, as will all school districts. Uh, and so you need to be aware of these things that are there. So I'm not going to go into any more detail than that. Um, it's just a whole lot of stuff, but I wanted to make sure that we are public in our discussions about these things that are happening. Any questions or, or comments? No, everybody's totally overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> when do we expect the eighth grade test results to come back? Nancy, what's the usual timeline on that? Um, we expect that by March sometime. It could be the first part of March, the middle part of March, or the last part of March, or maybe in April. <laughs> <laughs> we usually get them before well, that, though, don't we? Pardon me? Don't we usually get them before that? In the meetings that we went to this year, because they are all open responses, they did not promise that they would have any of them by the latter part of February, which is a time that, upon occasion, we have gotten them back at that time or the earlier part of March. They really talked more about the month of March. I think my speculation is they're not quite sure when they're going to get back and when they're going to have them, so they don't want to make too many promises. Um, but we would expect them close to the usual time with a little bit of it being later, probably. Since they've gone to open-ended, I assume the old tests that were multiple choice were probably computer corrected or computer that is correct. scored. Do they actually have some kind of committee that has to sit and read they, each test now? They do. They have, because the test this year, um, each student, the writing prompt looks similar to it has for the last several years, and the writing prompts are scored by groups of teachers in Maine. There were then 10 open response questions in reading, 10 open response questions in math, and then two open response questions for science, social studies, health, and the humanities. The system the company that helps design the test, um, Advanced Systems, hires people to read those open responses. So that's the group that will be correcting them on the scale of zero to four points each. So it will be interesting. And, and oh, I forgot, I, I did include, I think, in your packet, these are the National Education Goal Panel's Handbook for Local Goals Reports, or the Goals 2000, as they are listed here um, and have been talked about in the past few years. Um, we'll see more before we see less. I think the reason I want to make sure that we call this to your attention and get this into the discussion framework, we set goals every year. We have lots of discussions administratively and at the building level, how, how what the work is going on, is it advancing the goals? that the system has set, the board has set. Uh, what this is really telling us is that there's a national agenda out there. And one of the debates that's going on is, are we going to wind up with a national curriculum with uh, America 
with packaged curriculum. The, everybody says that's not the intent, nor will that be the result. Uh, what, but that what they are saying is that they're going to be very specific national and state statements about what youngsters should be able to do before they graduate from high school, and then it will be up to local communities to turn those rather general statements into very specific ones that match the curriculum as is adopt well as you know is is it generally understood at the local level. Um, frankly, I guess there are times when I wonder when we're all supposed to get the time to do this. But um, it is. It, it, I know it sounds confusing. It is sometimes very confusing to those of us who kind of eat, sleep, and breathe schools. But it is an important way to try to get results to drive school improvement rather than inputs. We've had a long time, we've talked about how many books in the library, how many square feet of space students have to have, what kind of offerings are we supposed to have. And this is our society's attempt to change that conversation to what does a student actually demonstrate that he knows by the time he is supposedly granted a high school diploma. And that effort is going on in a lot of different ways. The only thing I hope is that you said there is going to be money attached to this at some point. Well, that's what they say. I haven't seen well, it. I, but. I hope so. And I hope if there is that we can spend it on the things that we need. Some of those goals have something to do with us. Some are less you know, pressing for us in this community. But <coughs> I hope you know, for once they will fund a mandate. and. <laughs> let us use it in a way that will really help us improve. But I guess that we will see. Uh, and I didn't know if any of the board members who were at the MSMA conference wanted to share any of their experiences or whatever. It's interesting, the, the keynote speaker at the noon luncheon actually was telling us what, what where we're going as a society, as far as we're going to become an informat society. That's the new term, informat. So we're going to become an information communications uh, economy. And, and what we need to do to prepare, to prepare people to go into those fields. And, uh, and it was interesting, I also went to a workshop that he also did called Reinventing Public Education and it was preparing young Americans for the 21st century. And one of the things that he, he reiterated was that we traditionally have taught a passive uh, kind of lectured approach in education. And we only reached about 25% of our kids. And those are the 25% who went on to become, you know, the managers, the CEOs, the doctors, the lawyers. And Actually, 30% of our uh, people learn visually, and 45% learn tactile. So we're not meeting, really, 75% of, of people's learning styles in the old way we have taught. So the schools have really have got to, to re, retool how, how we deliver education so that we're producing people who and it was interesting because, especially coming from a community which, you know, 80 to 90 percent of them go on to post-secondary education, and a lot of them go on to schools of liberal arts. And what has happened over the last 10 years is that 80 percent of middle management will no longer be in existence. But actually, they're projecting within two years, by 1997. 80 percent of what we knew as middle management will be gone. And a lot of those middle management people were the, um, the college-educated, literate, literate, liberal arts, social science majors with no skills. Well, I just hope we, before we throw out all the <laughs> liberal arts, I, I hope um, I hope we don't get into a mode again where we, we say everything we've done in the past must be wrong and we need something totally different. I still think um, to have good citizens, you do need a, you know, a very literate um, 
student body that's versed in history and you know just has a well-rounded understanding of the world around them and knows how to find out information. So I hope we're not going to just assume they're all going to be robots sitting in front of a computer who don't have to think. Well, it's interesting because this also goes along with America 2000 in one of his handouts. There's a three-part foundation to what kids need to know. One of, them, one of them is the basic skills, which is being able to reading, writing, arithmetic, mathematics, listening, speaking. The other is thinking skills, which schools have not been very good about delivering. And that's creative thinking, decision making, problem solving, seeing things in the mind's eye, knowing how to learn, and reasoning. And the third is personal qualities, responsibility, self-esteem, sociability, self-management, integrity, and honesty some of the issues we were dealing mm -hmm. with tonight. Yeah. Good, I feel a little better now. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes along, you know, the goals 2000. Carla? I would just briefly say that um, as the first conference I went to, I was really pleased to see that it was worthwhile. You never really know before you go to an event like this if it's really going to be worthwhile. And of the four workshops that I attended, I would say that three of them were quite excellent, which is a a pretty good record. Um, the fourth was, um, it's not in the order of which ones I went to, since Connie also went to the fourth one I went to. I don't want her to think it's that one I'm talking about. Um, the one that wasn't very excellent was still, you know, I think worthwhile. It just wasn't the caliber of the others. Um, I really think that I picked up some good information. Some of it doesn't really have to do with anything that's going on now, but it's good to have the knowledge in case those sorts of situations do arise. It's, sort of good to have it on the back burner, to be aware of it. And I went to a, a very fine workshop on policy development. So I'm sure I will be sharing a lot of what I learned at that one with, with Beth as the policy subcommittee chair. Um, they had two school districts. Um, it was a new kind of workshop this year. I forget what they call it, experience-based, where school districts or board members or whatever who have been involved in a topic that's of interest to other school boards actually do the presentations and two school districts that went about developing their policy books in two different ways <coughs> kind of gave a little speech about how they approached it, and that was very interesting. Good. Anybody else? Keith? I also enjoyed the conference a, a lot. Um, one of the uh, workshops that I, that I went to that I particularly enjoyed was the uh, case study of, of Freeport High School um, in their win-win negotiations uh, with the teachers to. I guess they've had some real nightmare negotiating sessions in the past years, and they were able to put everything behind and, and uh, go into that win-win, and it seemed to work for them. So hopefully we can assimilate that Based here. on their experience. Okay, great. I had one more. I also attended that, that bargaining one. Um, I went to three, because I'm also your, I was your representative to the, the assembly. Um, one I did go was connecting vision with planning, and it was um, establishing a mission statement and, and connecting it with your plan for your school. And that, one of my goals was this year was to revisit our mission vision statement and to integrate it with a, with is it relevant and how do we put it into to to our plan for the school. Well, good you can share that with us as we move. Move forward. That is kind it of. It was interesting. Dilemma. One of the presenters is uh, the superintendent from Gorham. Mm. Oh. Yep. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to wind up on a pragmatic level here tonight. The playground. I did distribute. I think. I hope everybody got it. We had. Uh, I had said in my notes that we we're being visited by a representative from Learning Structures, and I didn't have the report at the time when I put out your packet, so I had to give it to you tonight, but this is not an action item at this point. I want to share very quickly that we've had two or three different uh, look-sees on that playground, uh, as well as looking at it from our internal capacity to fix it. Um, and what you have in this report is a list of things that need to be done to bring it up to par, and um, then there is a proposal which is uh, frankly relatively modest, much less than at one point I had thought would be the case from some of our preliminary information. 
the, in a nutshell, what we have here is a uh, playground structure. I understand the history. Some parts of it go back quite a ways, but the most recent manifestation was a parent uh, community uh, with some with a plan in place from an outfit called Learning Structures, uh, and these are the people we brought in to give us a sense: Can they bring it up to snuff? They do it themselves. We do it. Um, do they then help us with liability issues by giving us the plan or what have you? However, they do have a proposal here uh, where they would do it, and. Um, we would have some parts to be determined that we would uh, actually probably do. For instance, well, I might as well just read this because I realize people listening, this sounds pretty vague. The following are the estimates you've requested for repairs to the Cape Elizabeth Middle School playground. Please note the estimate uh, for learning structures incorporated to do all the required maintenance includes all of the labor materials and backbone costs, but does not include ground cover and wood ceiling. This would be left to your custodial staff or community volunteers. In other words, for a total of $4,000, they are proposing bringing it up to SNAP with some things still left to be done by the community. We do have some material left in a playground account, which was generated when we were dealing with a um, kindergarten playground. So this is a feasible approach. Uh, certainly would be our recommendation that we follow this plan, and we may need to Yet, since we haven't had a chance internally to discuss this at any length, we really just have gotten this back. We did have a preliminary quick look through by somebody who was not a member of this organization um, who had some concerns about liability issues, somebody who was connected with um, one of our insurance companies. Uh, he was much less sanguine. He really felt that the structure had outlived its usefulness and we ought to, frankly, dismantle a good deal of it. Uh, so this is the more hopeful uh, proposal, and I think that if we can bring it up to snuff, we need to continue our discussion with staff, with the uh, particularly with the teachers who are using it, or the teachers of the grades that are using it. And uh, I know um, had some conversation with our uh, parent groups. Um, would like to hear from parents. Are there some ideas about this? If we just repair it and it still isn't a satisfactory structure, um, that would be a mistake too. So we will. I don't think there's a whole lot that we can do at this time. After all, we are frankly going to get snow one of these days, and the forecasts I'm hearing are pretty ominous. And I don't know where people are looking at fuzzy caterpillars or what, but somebody told me we're going to have 30 storms this year, and I just about died. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, oh, but um, so I'm not sure what, what we're talking about in uh, repair timeline and so forth, but. This is a more hopeful uh, proposal than anything we've seen be before. Is this the group that um, helped build it? We've got the materials from learning structures? I believe so. Mm -hmm. Roberta, do you know that for a fact? It's before my time. Okay. That's my understanding. Um, but I know, is Nancy, is that true? Yes, it is. Okay. It is okay. Now, was this? So Sue knows. Do you, okay. Yeah. Um, Connie, did that, that quote include the. Um, the work that needs to be done on the two-pond playground no. as well, or is that just for the middle This is just for the middle school. So we do need a more time to discuss this administratively because we do have, actually, we have four uh, sets of playground equipment, one at the high school, the kindergarten one, two at Pond Cove, and then this one. This one is the one we've had the most complaints about and seems to be in the worst shape. Uh, but we do have some other problems, too, and we only have a limited amount of money in our playground account. Um, so we will continue to analyze this and come back uh, with a more specific issue and also let the parent community know, because we understand that they'd be willing to continue some input and help. Yeah, I, I think this is a really good opportunity, as was building um, that playground, to, you know, to, to make it a community function. And so I... I personally wouldn't want to rule out the idea of them just providing the supervision mm -hmm. for the community making those repairs. I think that's a, a great way to bring um, the community together to, to work on a project. It would save a lot of money that mm -hmm. could be used you know, also to, mm -hmm. to fix the other ones, which I'm, I'm sure at this point probably need some work also. Yeah. So I think, I think if, if this community lacks anything, it's those kind of projects to work on together, and that might be okay. um, a good good avenue to explore. Maybe it would help us with the, some of those other problems. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who knows? <clears throat> Roberta? I just have one question as far as the um, 
far as the other playgrounds go, does our insurance requirements call for some type of annual inspection of the equipment before? Yes, and um, we certainly have done our internal inspections, um, but things do, you know, we've been dealing with a whole lot of building issues, and there are, uh, at, the, at the moment, I'm not uh, confident that we have kept up our timeline, perhaps, as well as we should have. So they, these are issues that we're trying to get a handle on. Um, but anyway, this particular structure is, I think, without a doubt, in the most, yeah, we have the most uh, uh, pressing needs with this particular one. So I want to make sure that we acknowledge that, get, get with it, have a plan of action, um, and uh, move on. But we haven't forgotten we had the other playgrounds. I just have one more comment. I realize that snow will be coming, but the space limitation for <coughs> recess release time activity available to students will remain the same or get less. And although the snow may fly, Kids will still find some way of getting on that structure. Uh, so, so you think, yeah. So I, I understand there's many other uh, issues that are more priority, but it's still a, a matter that has to be addressed, I think, timely, whether snow comes or not. Okay. I'm sure. It's just that I don't know what the what's possible to do at what time. Okay, that's it. All right, moving on to school board subcommittees and reports. The first is finance subcommittee. Charlie. Uh, we met at 6.30 this evening, um, signed the warrants, um, discussed the lease agreement for the middle school copier, which we will um, act on under new business, um, looked at the appropriation report, and also discussed uh, the board consideration of salary adjustment for the interim principal of the Pond Cove School and the administrative stipend for the interim assistant special ed director. At this time, I would like to move that we um, fund a administrative stipend for the interim assistant special ed director. Second. Any discussion? Um, she would still be paid as a teacher. This would be an administrative stipend just for her administrative duties. She would still be on the teacher contract. Just to clarify. This is for her additional responsibilities. Any other comments? All in favor? 7-0. And that was the end of our business meeting. Okay, we should probably also mention that we discussed the negotiating teams um, for teacher negotiations, which are um, going to open shortly, and um, school board members who will serve will be Charlie Greer, Priscilla Armstrong, myself, and Beth Courier, just for the record. Okay, moving on to school building committee. Um, Bonnie. Right, we are at now at the point where we have monthly requisition meetings and monthly school building meetings. Uh, I should note that the next one is the 21st, which is Monday of Thanksgiving week, since the fourth Thursday of the month is when we had those school building committee meetings, and I really didn't think people would want to come in on Thanksgiving. No. <laughs> um, the, uh, the project really is moving along very well. I think people can see that. Um, Sue Weatherby continues as our coordinator working most directly with Jim Gilman, the clerk of the works. Um, we were told that Jim Gilman was a very skillful and able clerk of the works, I would say, having been involved in a number of projects in my 12 years as a superintendent. It's the smoothest I've been through so far. What is? <laughs> and um, I have to say, I think that there's probably a lot of credit to from the day-to-day -day operation going to a particularly skillful clerk of the works. They, if you have a good one, they can make a whole lot of difference. We also, of course, have some input from our own maintenance director, Dan Reed, uh, but we also, uh, we seem to be moving along on schedule. Now, having said as much, I'm sure tomorrow the phone will ring and uh, I shouldn't probably even say anything. But uh, the committee meeting was relatively uneventful. We were simply dealing with uh, some fairly small change orders that have come about. Um, we had some discussions about some other possible changes, um, but nothing major. And um, 
the move is still anticipated uh, for putting um, the current first grade and, and uh, second grade into Lunt buildings so that those parts of the buildings uh, can be rehabbed the second half of the year. Uh, you can certainly see, what, <coughs> excuse me, the visible building that's going on from what will be the cafeteria and the, or cafetorium, I should say, and the gym. <coughs> so since I'm going to lose my voice, that's it. <laughs> Carl, um, since you mentioned the first and second graders moving, and I, I know that we've discussed this many times before, but I'm still hearing a lot of questions from people. When the students start to eat in their classrooms, a lot of people are still wondering whether they'll be able to get hot lunch. Well, um, our, our, certainly our sense is that yes, they will be, food will be uh, available. Um, Nancy, do you have any more particulars on that at this point? The hot lunch, what kind of hot lunch? Obviously, it's not going to be hot the, variety. you know, the, I'm the just kinds and I've varieties heard a lot of and so on. About this. It certainly will be lunch available, and it probably will exceed the peanut butter and jelly routine. Now, exactly where it is on that continuum, uh, I'm not sure I know at this point. I met with Sue King probably two weeks ago now, and we worked out a lot of the finer points of, in that regard. They will be having a combination of, in choice of bag lunch, there will be hot dishes to select from and, um, you know, just sort of an array of, of the usual offerings for youngsters. Well, I think so what people were wondering, and that does answer it, I think people were under the impression that they would have to pack a lunch for their kids every single day. No, they do not need to do that. In fact, it's looking, looking very good. The atrium on the uh, first floor is, is large, and we're looking to set up two tables outside the elevator area so that youngst youngsters can come in that back door. There's a large back door. They'd come in there, file through, uh, perhaps go into the washrooms, uh, pick up their lunches, and move into their classrooms. Uh, the same process will work on the second floor for the first graders. And uh, there's a large space there that will have the table set up and the youngsters will be able to come through, will be able to go into the individual classrooms and eat in their rooms. Are you anticipating that that process will take any longer? In other words, I mean, we have that um, finite lunch period. We're not anticipating that it will take any longer. We have built in for that reason, there's a seven minute transition period between lunches that we anticipated this year we might need to do some kind of adjusting and that would pick up that piece in there. The youngsters would have the time. I assume at some point before this happens and a notice will go home to the parents explaining the change. Plan that. Change. <laughs> yeah. Um, as Nancy met with Sue two weeks ago, I had occasion to meet with she and Scott a week ago, and uh, and that's a continuing process of refining the answers <laughs> to the questions. As as they work out the details, uh, new questions come up, and that's what's going on. And and uh, Sue's done a nice job with uh, managing those questions. Uh, in fact, I sent them a, a memo with. Uh, complete page of questions on these things some time back and she's responding to all of those now and we will send uh, like a parent memo this is this is all the news that's fit to print about hot lunch in Jan from January to June uh, we don't anticipate that they would send or have to send lunches to the kids but the principal's a pastry freak so if they want to send me some cookies I'd appreciate that. <laughs> Um, just another question. If you send out the memo on the hot lunch, I hope you also go through any other details, transportation in terms of drop-off and pickup, because I think, um, you know, the walkers or the kids that are being picked up by parents now are at the fourth grade end, and parents will probably want to know that's where they'll still be, and will they be walked up just outside, and if it's pouring, you know, all of that detail should be carefully thought through. And I think a lot of those issues, Beth, will be covered when Sue Weatherby gets to do the next piece of communication as transportation, I mean, as a communication person for the project. Yeah, I'm, su I'm sure they will be. It's probably nice if they all go out as one package. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to happen with lunch. This is the door that sure. you should walk into every time. This is where you should park, you know, all of those things. If it all comes together, I think it would be read and kept and referred back to. As soon as we have the specifics, yeah. we'll be glad to do that. Charlie. In talking to the business manager yesterday, one of the questions I asked was what's going to happen with the cafeteria situation when Pond Cove closes. Part of the staff will go to the high school, part of the staff will go 
to the middle school, the high school will prepare most of the cold preparation, which will then be brought to the middle school where most of the hot preparation and will all be collated there, put together, and then delivered to the classrooms. We should all keep our it's sense of humor. Hot. Whatever <laughs> happened to, to fluffer nutters? Remember yeah. fluffer so, nutters? And just I was assured that there would be right there now. would be a hot lunch provided. In the end, I, I would invite all members of the board to join us for the first <laughs> week of activities, so that you too can experience this marvelous event. <laughs> well, we'll get through it. Yes, no doubt. And we should probably just note that um, I. I said last month that we might have the color selections for the interior of the new buildings here tonight. That, that doesn't turn out to be very practical, um, but uh, we do have drawings, samples of the flooring, samples of the paint and lockers that will be in the superintendent's office if, if anybody wants to see them. And we'll try to find some, some way to, to present them to people, but here tonight did not seem to be very practical. I don't think they'd come across very well under these lights are um, be particularly meaningful. So that was a real, that was really fun. And we move on to uh, what, what do we have still left to do? We, we still have to do the gym, the gym floor, the gym floor, and, but we made miscellaneous, very, very good and furnishings. Very good progress furnishings. and furnishings. That's right. <laughs> okay. Anything else on the building? Except everybody's still doing a great job. And everybody got the, seemed to get through conferences and, and all that very well. I heard no complaints from parents. That the staff seems to be um, holding up with, with good humor. The kids seem to be fine. So it's really, it's, it's really been kind of a joy of a process, I think, considering um, you know, the magnitude of the things we're going through. All right. Yep. <laughs> Policy sub. I just oh. want to make one other comment. Yeah. It's just now seeing the Lunt building and the new administrative mm -hmm. wing coming into shape. It just, it's exciting to see that this is the way it's going to progress around the whole campus. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting. It's a big contrast from a year ago. I thought when I voted yeah. this morning, boy, oh, right. I was so nervous last year. Yeah. But it felt pretty good today. That's right. Policy subcommittee back. Uh, the policy subcommittee met on uh, Wednesday, October 26th in the <coughs> superintendent's conference room. Um, we reviewed mostly special ed policies um, and do not have a lot of new business tonight, but we have some second readings and some other um, things to go through. We will meet again on uh, November 30th, again at 9.30. And since uh, policy second reading is the next item, you might yep. as well just jump right in. Um, we have a... Um, Second reading tonight on a number of policies. Should I go ahead and make the motion listing the policies and discuss them after that? I'd like to make a motion that we um, accept for a second reading policies IGDJ-R1, Athletic Rules and Regulations, IGDJ-R2, Athletic Policy, um, IKD-R, Honor Roll, IKF, Graduation Requirements, JECE, -E, Positive Action Committee, JEFC, Early Dismissal for High School Seniors. There were some changes from the first readings um, after discussion here. And if anybody would like me to um, point them out, let me know. That was a motion. Okay, oh, sorry. That second. shouldn't be part of the motion. Carly. OK, discussion. Is anybody? Charlie? There's a, a couple policies. Um, the honor roll policy, there were some type of typographical yes. errors. Uh, yeah, She's yeah. been made aware. Yes, and I, I should point out that Connie is sick tonight, and we've been fortunate to have Sue Coffey filling in for us tonight. Thank you, Sue. Um, and Connie did want me to tell you that this is something that she was aware of, and that she, when you get your final copy for your board, that that will be taken care of. Um, I had a couple other ones. Um, on the early release, early dismissal, there are students who come to school late with, with approval. Should that be a part of this policy? It's not early dismissal. They're allowed to come to school late, which is also a senior prerogative if they don't have a class. 
So it's not, it's not just early dismissal for high school seniors. They are also allowed to come to school late. That's right, and actually we did discuss that at the meeting. Was it the same application that they fill out for either early dismissal? Parent permission allows both. Parent permission allows both. So maybe we can just Is that enough just to hide? Yeah, just yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. That should have been added to that. Mm -hmm. um, Everywhere that those words are. And in some cases we have students who can, over the course of a week or the four-day rotation, may have both an early... Uh, early dismissal or a late arrival. So one form can be signed by the parent to do that. For some students, it may be simply late arrival, as you mentioned, Charlie, or early dismissal. So um, Beth, I can get that form to you and any changes. That's fine. There? Actually, we discussed that I, as the, the idea behind this whole right. policy any, anyway was early dismissal right. and, um, okay. and late arrival. Late arrival. Okay. Um, so we can't. We can't and vote on that. We can amend. Yeah, we can amend that. With amend. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I would propose that we amend JEFC to include anywhere where it says early dismissal, add late arrival, slash late, slash late, late arrival. arrival. There's a couple places yeah. where it appears. Do I get a second? Any, we did second. have the second already. Okay. Carlos seconded. This was the discussion. Anybody else have any comments on any of these? Okay. All in favor? We're just voting, move, voting on the amendment. amendment. Oh, we're just oh, oh. I still have a couple other questions. Okay. Okay. All right. So are we voting on the amendment? Okay. On the amendment. We can vote on the amendment. Yes. To that policy. Right. You haven't okay. accepted the policy, uh, you're just voting on the amendment. Right. Okay. We're being very formal. We <laughs> never have had to do that before. Okay. All in favor of the amendment? 7 0. Okay. I have one other question of clarification, and that has to do with positive action committee. Somebody, I've been on the board five years, and I've, there are some things in this, yeah. this particular policy that I've never never even heard of a, a positive action committee. Um, Is it ever convened? It, it has. Actually, I have served on this twice. Okay. Um, it was formally called something else. Dropout, something dropout, dropout prevention, prevention That's right. committee. And it, and it only meets when, they're, when the high school determines that there's a need. And as the, as the chairman, I've been the one who they've... Okay. Who the other thing... There's reporting to the school board. I don't think that's right. Ever... No, that no, I don't think that has. <laughs> that should. I, I think what we plan to do is at the end of toward the end of the school year to report any of any any of the uh, meetings that we have had concerning potential uh, dropouts and, and how it's been handled. But as Ann said, I think we've had two situations where Ann has represented us as the, as a school board uh, person on that, and it was the dropout prevention committee that is now the positive action committee. And one of the things you should know that we do have a weekly meeting of, of what we call a pupil services team, which consists of, the, of, of uh, uh, Mr. Ray, myself, the uh, guidance, guidance staff, uh, school nurse, social worker. And that's where we address issues or concerns um, of students who may be potential, potentially may not graduate or, and, and Generally, it's from that meeting we go to the next phase, which is the uh, positive action committee. So I think we have a, we have a real good handle of the of, of the process um, in in uh, identifying potential problems that we may have with students who may, may not simply be uh, the problem of dropping out of school, but also the problem of you know carrying enough credits to be a junior or a senior. And I, I think we do a, a very good. Uh, job of that. Oh, I'm not questioning that. No, and I know saying. my first year on the board, we had a concern about students being able to graduate. And one of the board's requests is that, that the school staff get a handle on this much earlier than in the year than waiting till the last quarter. And yeah. I know that that has taken place. Yeah. So. Thank you. Actually, I think, and I think I said this last month, but I, I have found both, uh, both times I have come to these meetings to be very positive. Um, and, and I think as productive as they could be under the circumstances, but I've been very impressed with the high school staff. The, the times that I've been involved is basically for the meeting when they've, they've already identified the person, they've worked through issues with the student and the family, and this is like the final um, formal meeting, but I've been very impressed with how they've handled them. Thank you. You know, I think as a system we kind of lose sight that we don't have a high 
percentage of dropouts, you know, it's maybe one percent of that. Right. And, and but I th and I've been um, very, um, very impressed with the individual attention these kids are getting, um, and a real, real, um, real emphasis on trying to meet their needs and to get them to stay in school and graduate. It's really. No, I wasn't questioning that because no, no. I know that I because of some that. graduation require yeah. problems in the past that, that the schools are being more uh, proactive in, in that aspect. And I only have one other comment, and that has to do with policy IKDR honor roll. And I'm going to vote for the changes with reservations. I think we need to look at this policy in a workshop situation. I think because I really don't think it's applicable. Well, at least it's it's honest with what we're doing now. No, I agree, and that's why I will vote. But it's with reservations because we have we have as a board, not this particular board per se, have talked about this particular issue, and it has never really been addressed. We kind of skirted the honor roll a year or so ago in in a workshop, but. I think we really need to look at this whole policy of grading and how we grade and um, the weighted grade. And we really need to do it. No, I think, and I think the policy um, subcommittee is moving ahead with some of those issues at the high school um, as far as the weighted grade thing. But I would agree with you, there, there's some deeper issues here, but I, I, I think the main thing we wanted to do for now was to make sure that um, at least we had on record what we're actually doing um, before it was not what we no. were doing at all um, and I recognize that but it's with reservation right. as you may recall though we couldn't get consensus to last year to really move one way or another um, so but I, I, I agree with you I'm a little uncomfortable with just letting this issue drop so any That's other comments from anybody Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. Okay. We have to deal with the rest of these. Yeah, I think we. Um, I don't know. Do you want to do them now under unfinished business or under new business? I guess we're not under new business. Um, we have a few policies to be reviewed and accepted as they are in the policy from our policy um, subcommittee meeting. Um, they are IGBAC, referral to the pupil evaluation team, IGBAM, exceptional students homeschooled or private, privately educated, and IGBB, gifted and talented. Um, we also, um, we're going to drop three policies if you flip over that sheet. Um, IGB BAC-E1, there is a new one being written, but that one is completely wrong. Um, IGBAI-R1, IGBAI-R2 are all things that um, we do not need in our policy books. And the one being written is a very general one that will refer to all the uh, policy manuals in the schools for how things will be carried out in terms of all of those. Okay, any comments on that? Okay. Can we just deal with these as one motion? Yeah. To accept the recommendation to, from the yeah. policy subcommittee. Okay. So, uh, I would I'd like motion? to make a motion that we accept the ones I just read. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, <laughs> I guess, it, can I, I do that? I can't yeah, make that motion. So. Um, the ones I just read to um, review and accept as they are, and then the three to um, delete from the policy books. Is there a second? Second. Right. Any discussion? All in favor? <clears throat> Seven zero. I always like getting out of the miasma of uh, <laughs> policy papers here. Could I just ask um, on the dates on the back of that? Yes. Was that February 21 supposed to be January, or is that indeed what the? Oh no, well, it's probably. Uh, it's probably definitely January. I didn't actually check those. Oh. I had given them to all to Connie. We'd gone over uh -huh. them at our meeting, but I didn't check them right here. November 30th and December 21st are both correct. Okay. Um, probably, 
That school vacation. February 21st. It's probably January probably 21st. Is. Yeah. Then March 1st is like the February meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's. It. I think that okay. sounds right. Okay. It's always um, about 12 days before the board meeting, um, whatever that falls on for a Wednesday. I think the system is working well too. I liked Connie's directive to uh, Connie Brown's directive to remove the policies from the book. Otherwise, I think we're all prone to say yes. Well, someday we will do that. It's a good way to keep those books in order. All right, moving on to new business consideration and action on a copier lease. We did discuss this at the finance subcommittee meeting, um, and it is a copier lease that replaces the. Uh, a, a worn out copier at the middle school and um, when you make the motion we have as we've gone through in the past discovered that we need to take a vote that explicitly uh, follows the recommended language from our attorneys and you had that before you so it, a motion would be in order to um, accept that language Charlie I move that under and pursuant to the provisions of Title 20-AMRSA Sections 1001 and 1055, the Superintendent of Schools be and hereby is authorized to ex execute and deliver a tax-exempt lease purchase agreement with People's Heritage Savings Bank in the name and on behalf of the Cape Elizabeth School Committee for copier equipment with an aggregate purchase price of $13,143.71 in such form as the superintendent may approve and at all. Sir, second. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? I was I'll afraid Carly was gonna read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> all in favor. <laughs> Seven zero. I do follow instructions. Actually, I think this whole thing is one sentence also, yes. like they always are. Well, so. we will insert that in our minutes as the language, um, and because we find that if we don't make that very explicit, then the, oh, I forget exactly what the chain of command on all of that is, but anyway, you've done your duty. Thank you. Okay, the next item is appointments to Community Services Advisory Commission. There are actually four appointments here, and the, um, because we have four appointees, two of whom uh, are repeating their, or serve, are going to be entering their second round of service, and two new people, so I'll read the four names, if you can vote on them as a single slate. Eugene Torrey, uh, Ernest... Locks, oh, shoot, let's see, I get his name. Locks, sir. Locks, Locks here, and I apologize for not getting that, reading somebody's handwriting here. Um, Mary Jean Moore and Sue Hall Dreyer, and those are four appointees, but, but with two, on two separate terms for the advisory committee for community services. Is there a motion, Beth? I'd like to make a motion that we accept the four um, nominees for the um, Community Services Advisory Commission. Is there a second? Yeah. Any discussion? Charlie? Who's the chairman now? Uh, Jane Greer. She was our appointee, right? Do we appoint the chairman? Or do, no. they, do they elect they the chair? Okay. Okay. Okay, all in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. Okay, moving on to personnel requests. And I have two appointments. One is the, I gave you a copy of the beta for Marjorie Ann Queen, and I'm nominating her for the long-term substitute position beginning in January. It will be from January to June. Uh, as a replacement for the high school phys ed position that we discussed at our last board meeting. Uh, Kristen Ames says, you may recall, has asked for an unpaid leave of absence from January to June to continue her studies at the university. Um, and you, as you can see, we are appointing as is our practice when we can find a good substitute who has experience. Since this is more than one semester, we will be placing this 
um, substitute on scale. Can we, um, can we deal with Oh, yeah, the we can do the other one. Well. Uh, you may also recall from, I think actually it was probably our September board meeting, we had a request for a full time position going to half time. That was a combination position of reading recovery and chapter one um, remedial reading. Uh, and the piece that we reduced was the chapter one remedial reading. I explained at the time that we'll be posting that in house as a we were confident we had somebody, actually we had a number of people who were qualified and applied. We've gone through our process. And so I'm nominating Bernadette Frost to fill that halftime position uh, as chapter one teacher. Bernadette, you may recall, has already been working for us as a full-time uh, ed tech two. And you may wonder how one can be a full-time ed tech two and a part-time teacher. And the answer to that is she becomes a half-time ed tech two and a half-time teacher. Actually, she remains a full-time employee, but half of her duties now are uh, will be under a teaching contract. Um, and uh, obviously, her duties at, for that half-time ed tech two will be filled in by somebody else. So the appointment from the board perspective and the board vote is to the half-time chapter one teaching position. And that's till the end of this year. That's Just correct. That's okay. yeah, exactly. All right. Okay, Beth? I'd like to make a motion that we accept the superintendent's nominations of Marjorie Ann Queen for the long-term subposition for um, high school phys ed, and Bernadette Frost for the half-time chapter one teacher position. Yes. Is there a second? Second. Mm -hmm. Carla. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. Okay, moving on to nominations for athletic B coaching positions and curricular positions. And you have in your packet that list: uh, seventh grade girls basketball, Victoria Reynolds; seventh and eighth grade B team girls basketball, Kevin Sears; eighth grade girls basketball, Jeff Carlisle. Excuse me, girls indoor track, Larry Greer, and boys indoor track, Larry Greer; assistant indoor track, Scott Henry and assistant indoor track part-time Bill Rice. And since that sounds like a lot of repetition, we included in the back of this page an explanation of those hours and the sums assigned to them, which obviously have to add up to the total fees assigned to those positions, and they're simply divided up, as you, as you see in that explanation. <coughs> back on the other Sheet, I'm happy to announce that we have an appointment for affirmative action officer since I've been filling that slot for a while. <laughs> uh, so I'm grateful that Belinda Snell has uh, agreed to do that. And we have two debate appointments, Lincoln Douglas, Nancy Ziegler, and extemporaneous Terry Garming. Your motion, Beth? I'd like to make a motion that we accept the superintendent's nominations for athletic fee positions and additional co-curricular positions as presented. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? 7 zero. That, That's it. That is it. That is I it. would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? <laughs> and zero. Let's go home and see the election. how the elections results are coming in. I'm so glad we don't have a bond. I thought about that when I was down this Excuse me. But it was such a. Yeah, I'll get the stuff to you. Uh, it's not that many policies, so if you want to discuss it, Debbie Riley talked to you quickly today.